previously on the Talk Better Project. Okay, so American politics is a little bit like Star Wars. The Democrats are Ewoks, the Republicans are Wookiees, the Senate passed the ACA, and depending on who you ask, President Obama is either a Jedi or a Sith? Hi internets, I'm Ross. Welcome back to the Talk Better Project, where I try to explain some of the conversations about topics in the news. Why was Obamacare even written, you know? Well, Teddy Roosevelt, back in 1901, might have the answer. Here we are in part three. In part one, we saw people coming from different backgrounds. In part two, we talked about how those different backgrounds lead people to see the same facts doing different things. Now, part three, what history has to say about it. What other laws have existed? Who's tried to pass them and why? In Greek mythology, it was believed that Athena, the goddess of wisdom and warriors, was born when she sprung forth from the head of Zeus fully formed. In the same way, the ACA sprung forth from the heads of those who wrote it with absolutely no relevance to laws of the past or history whatsoever. Obviously not. Obamacare may have been written and passed by the Democratic Party, but making healthcare affordable and insurance accessible to everyone has been an objective of politicians from all sides for as long as we've been keeping track. Because staying alive is expensive, and it's been getting more expensive. If you want to see some really exciting spreadsheets, charts, and data, check the description below the video. But did you know that since we've been tracking healthcare costs, they've only increased? Not only that, the first three decades in which we tracked those costs, the rate at which they increased, increased. Long story short, in the 60s, about 5% of all of the money that we Americans spent on all of our stuff went to healthcare. In 2015, it was more in the ballpark of 18%. So not only is healthcare becoming more expensive for you and me, it's also taking up a bigger and bigger part of our national economy. And what has medicine done for anyone recently? I mean, sure, we eradicated polio and smallpox back in the 80s, but other than that, has medicine really changed that much in the last 100 years? Politicians care about how much we pay for healthcare and whether or not everyone can afford it. One of America's favorite presidents, Teddy Roosevelt, is attributed with saying, no country could be strong whose people were sick and poor. What I want to show today is that the best way to have a really bad conversation with someone about the ACA or healthcare in general is to assume that someone, some politician or some political party, has disagreed with President Roosevelt. Let's take a look at laws that have passed and laws that haven't to show that everyone is trying to take steps in the right direction. We're just having a hard time agreeing on what the right direction is. Let's look at the last century or so. We'll put World War II over here. You remember World War II. It was a spot of unpleasantness in the 40s that fundamentally altered pretty much everything about modern life with lasting ramifications we're still trying to identify. According to me personally, what I think could probably be called the most important law written about healthcare in America was here in 1965. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, signed the Social Security Act, creating Medicare and Medicaid, two government-backed insurance programs which still provide coverage to millions of Americans. They provide insurance to people older than 65 and the poor, and what do those two groups have in common? Well, they probably don't have jobs and so can't get insurance easily. Wait, what? Did you know that in the middle of World War II, Congress put a freeze on prices for goods and wages for employees? For six years, companies struggled to attract new, good workers because it was illegal to offer raises. So companies came up with a pretty good idea. They'd offer other things, like insurance. And it worked. Unfortunately, it also stuck. Wage controls only lasted from 1941 to 1947, but the idea that insurance comes with a job and jobs come with insurance stuck. Americans rarely question this, and yet it altered the landscape for how we talk about insurance and who deserves it. But if you get your insurance through your employer, what about retirees? What about people who can't work or are unemployed? What about YouTubers? Hey, how did they get YouTubers insurance in the 60s? Hence the Social Security Act. If insurance comes through your employer, you have to look out for people who can't get that insurance anymore or who don't have jobs. But that's pretty much it for huge society changing laws. 1965 to 2010, we don't see a major healthcare reform success. But remember, costs kept rising. Everyone agrees that if the American people are poor and sick, we can't be a strong nation. So let's start from the far left and move to present day to see how different parties and politicians have tried to improve healthcare. First significant failure, 1948. President Harry S. Truman, Democrat. Three years after the end of World War II, President Truman got elected thinking he had the full support of the American people because he had campaigned on a post-war plan called the Fair Deal, and a universal health care plan was part of it. Unfortunately, the Fair Deal went forward in 1949 without universal health care because certain senators from certain southern states worried that universal health care coverage would require desegregating hospitals. Yeah, um, so we could have had universal health care by the 50s if it hadn't been for Democrats who didn't want to desegregate hospitals. 
Seriously. So after 1949, the next milestone is 1965, the Social Security Act signed by President Johnson. Not one to be overshadowed by one of the single most important social reform laws ever written and passed, President Johnson was also notorious for taking his penis out and waving it at White House guests. Repeatedly. I'm not joking. Next up, in 1971, we came close to having a president make huge, sweeping changes to Medicare and Medicaid, which would have effectively required coverage for everyone in the country, employed or not, and offered subsidies to companies and people who couldn't afford the insurance. That president was a Republican, Richard Nixon, who I guess became a little bit better known for other things that happened during his presidency. In the 80s, a president got a significant law passed that helped to protect workers and people with pre-existing conditions in case they lost their jobs. That was President Ronald Reagan, who I'm pretty sure I've been told was a Republican. Then in the 90s, President Clinton, a Democrat, envisioned something that looked a lot like Obamacare looks today, but ultimately failed to get it through Congress. But he did manage to expand insurance coverage for children up to age 19. George W. Bush, Republican, got distracted by something going down in the Middle East, but did eventually pass a pretty big expansion of Medicare. In 2010, as we know, President Obama, Democrat, ultimately got the ACA passed. Last month, in September 2017, Republicans failed multiple attempts to repeal Obamacare and replace it with a law more to their liking, or repeal it altogether. So now as we can look at the sweep of American legislation about healthcare, here's my point. The ACA was a huge deal. Not only because of how much it changes right now, but also where it falls in history. People from all sorts of backgrounds have been trying to accomplish something that keeps Americans healthy and healthcare affordable. And remember, healthcare costs have been rising for as long as we've been tracking them and taking up an increasingly larger part of our economy. Figuring out how to make Americans healthy without making them poor has been the struggle of a long time, and we're still working on it. The ACA is trying to get all Americans health insurance with healthcare that they can afford and provide distributed risk to insurance companies. Bad political conversations will happen if we start suspecting of people we disagree with that they want a country whose people are sick and poor. Try to avoid assuming that, and instead debate about how the ACA goes about doing what it does. In other words, you can dislike how the ACA does what it does and still be a Democrat, or think that the ACA is a step in the right direction and still be a Republican. Everyone wants a strong country, but we're not there yet, and lessons from history can help us. Well, most lessons from history can help. I mentioned President Johnson's Johnson fascination because it is bonkers. Now that we've talked a bit about the historical context of the ACA, next time we're looking not at philosophies or politics, but each political party's stakes in the conversation. Why do Republicans react the way they do? And why do Democrats talk how they do? What are the parties up to? Thank you for putting up with me this far. I'm Ross, and this is the Talk Better Project. I'm not trying to tell anyone what or how to think. I'm just trying to encourage people to have better conversations with people they disagree with. Hate bad political conversations? You can help. Please visit my Patreon page or subscribe to my channel. Sharing, liking the video really help. Thanks. See you around. Next time on the Talk Better Project. While debates about the Obamacare repeal raged on the House floor, Speaker of the House Paul Ryan is said to have announced, it's my party. I'll cry if I want to. But in fact, there ain't no party like an Obamacare party because an Obamacare party don't stop.